drive to Vegas. I get out of the car. I go to my hotel room. I go upstairs. Uh, Diane Ford calls me, and she goes, the show's late o'clock. Be there at 7.30. You know, in that whole conversation, I did not ask her who I was working with or who were the replacements with. I never even fucking seen it coming. I put my fucking tuxedo on. I look like a a two-pound bologna in a one-pound bag, you know, my fucking tuxedo. And I walk to the green room. When I walk into the green room, there was one comic in there. And the comic's name was Tim Allen. Are you serious? <laughs> it's fucking Tim Allen. Fucking shining his shoes. You know, like a guy has a, a foot up on a counter... And they're shining their shoes. He's fucking shining his shoes. And I'm like, oh my God. I felt like one of those fags when it rains on the gay pride. Like I just started sweating profusely. Like somebody rained on my parade. Like I, I'm saying this because one time I was living in Hollywood and it rained during gay pride. And I saw one of the gay guys live down the block from me. And I saw him with his little flower fucking all fucked up. He was like, somebody rained on my parade. So I was laughing about that. That's why, bro, I saw Tim Allen. I was like, what the fuck is this? And then it was me, Tim Allen, and Vinny Favorito, a kid out of Boston. He's back in Boston now. Let me tell you something, man. I didn't say nothing. Diane Ford came in. And she goes, Tim Allen, Joey Diaz, Joey Diaz, Tim Allen. We shook hands. I didn't say nothing. In fact, he fucking came to me and he's like, hey man, can you do extra time? And I'm like, yeah. Why? He goes, I haven't been on stage in months. I don't know what this is going to be like. And I'm like, I got you. Don't worry about nothing. And I didn't play him. I didn't try to be fucking cute. I just shut my mouth and I drank my water. You know, I just so happened to go on stage that night and by the luck of God, I leveled the fucking room. And he came over to me and said, that was great, kid. And how long have you been doing this? Da, 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 da. And I told him, you know, it took like about an hour or so. And I guess, I think we went back to his room. He said, do you want to come back to the room and get something to eat? So we get back to the room. And after about an hour, I try, you know, you try to control yourself. You know, you try not to be a half a fan and go, I'm a huge fan. You know, I went to prison, you know. So after about an hour or so, I think maybe the next night, I said to him, you know, uh, listen, I go, I just want to tell you something, that you helped me get from point A to point B. You were like my Federal Express. I go, I had a felony, I went to prison, and I, and I got into comedy, and then I realized that, you know, I, I had a felony, how far could I go make this a career I didn't know if clubs did background checks you know I just didn't know at the time and uh, once I saw that you had gone to prison it made my life my life a lot easier I go I'm such a fan of yours that when I had a pick on what city to go on the road first I picked Detroit out of homage to you I go I, in fact I even tried to play Mark Ridley's comedy club but they said I was a bit too dirty. And he's like, fuck them. You know, like, he was really cool at that. And he goes, uh, I told him I, I ended up playing Dearborn Joey's in Dearborn. And that, you know, if it wasn't for him, then it was the truth. Because Kennison Pryor, all those guys had inspired me to do stand-up. But once, you know, I went to prison, it was completely different. And I told him I had gone to prison. And I don't know what happened. We went into a four fucking hour talk and he told me the importance of being honest on stage and letting your audience know the truth. He goes, tell them, tell them, make jokes around it, write around it. But he goes, you don't want to not tell them because that's part of who you are. You know, you quit in high school. You know, I told him the same story I'm telling you guys. You know, you quit in high school. That's part of who you are today. It's in your DNA. It's a part of who you are. It's part of your persona on stage. You got to tell them everything and then some. You just can't tell them a little bit of your life. 
if you open that door, you got it's like you know when you when you're writing, they say not to open up a door unless you're gonna close it. So if you're gonna open up that fucking door, you better open up that fucking door. You know, when if you listen to podcasting, I started with Beauty and the Beast. Same thing happened there. It was just two people talking until one day I told the story about mugging a hooker and light her wig on fire and everything changed. Everything changed because my guts came out. My guts came out. Now you become indebted to me. So, you know, I found that at that point when I had to talk with Tim Allen that what the fuck was going on. Now, two things happened that summer. Me and that girl broke up and I had that talk with Tim Allen. Me and the crazy stripper girl broke up who I just spoke to a couple of days ago. She's doing great. I still love her to death 20 years later without her. I would have never got to L.A., but we broke up. We weren't getting along, you know. My expectations of L.A., her of L.A. and her expectations were completely different. Uh, but that's where Joe Rogan says he got really fucking funny. I don't know where. I don't know what happened. Why? A. I became honest on stage, and B. I stopped dating that girl. Most of my energy was focused on her. But let's not blame her. Let's not blame her. Let's blame Tim Allen for telling me to be honest on stage. That was the most important thing. And that's why when I'm doing podcasts, when I'm on fucking stage, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. If somebody, like, I'll tell you. You know everything I already did just by us talking here. There's a couple things I left out because it involves certain people or it would sink somebody else's name in it, but anything I've done, I've brought to the stage, whether it be the performing stage or the podcast stage, because nothing should be held back. So if you're a comic and you have like an uncle who's a junkie, but you're scared about talking about him, fuck him. Talk about him. It's his fault he's snorting glue. That ain't got nothing to do with you. If he wants to be an idiot and droob on his fucking shirt, you got to talk about it. Charlie. Nothing is, yeah, yeah, it's the truth. <laughs> Nothing is sacred. So that shame that I had over fucking quitting high school and fucking, you know, you just, you're just ashamed about things. Don't ever be ashamed about them. First of all, you can't fucking bring them back. There's nothing I could do to undo that fucking belt. Nothing I could do. It's done. I did it, and I moved forward. Until I became honest with it, I wasn't moving forward. 